scripture reading at this time comes from Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. Hear God's word from Genesis chapter 1, beginning with verse 26. Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, over the livestock, and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. May God add a blessing to the reading of his holy word. Chaos, destruction, disorder, war, factions, dissension, pollution, abuse, prejudice, oppression, slander, divisions, hatreds, mobs, violence, genocide. Slavery, trafficking, fear. These are all conditions that our souls cry out against. There's something deep within us that tells us that these things are wrong, that they're a stain on our humanity. There's something very basic concerning what makes us human, which we share with all of humankind. It defines us. We, we somehow know that it represents the best in us and it's common to all even when we don't practice it or acknowledge it. Somehow we know intrinsically that what we re would refer to as our humanity, what defines us as human beings, has everything to do with something that is good within us, something that we should strive toward. This idea of our humanity is something that I think all people would acknowledge, regardless of religion or worldview. It exists within us, even if we're among those who have not been redeemed by God, for its very existence implies that we are yet redeemable. You are human. You are human. And there's a value in that. There is significance, there's dignity, there is worth. You are human. I, I know that even hearing that invokes within many people a yearning to be acknowledged in our humanity, a, a need to be recognized as having value, significance, dignity, worth. Too many of us have been through the experience of being treated as if we were insignificant. Too many of us have been made to feel like a throwaway item, expendable, worthless, invisible. Human beings are counted as inventory by large corporations. They're mindless machines who use us up and cast us aside. Human beings are dehumanized by human traffickers who enslave and treat human bodies as empty shells and are mindless of the precious soul within. Human beings are demeaned, belittled, and cursed by other human beings who would rob them of their dignity. Bullies humiliate. Employers debilitate. Even churches can cast aside and devalue. These things have become all too common. As a result, post-traumatic stress, PTSD, is, is not reserved just for soldiers who have been through combat and who have had their, their souls violated by war. But now it's experienced regularly by those who battle for the dignity of their souls in everyday life. 
Now, why is this wrong? How can we say that this is not just the natural order of things, a, a mere expression of the survival of the fittest? Why is it that our souls cry out against the violence done to them as something inherently unnatural and inhuman? Is there something that defines our humanity? And if so, what are the implications of that humanity? Let's find out, but first, let's pray. Lord, as we come to your word, we come again hungry and thirsty, not just for information, but for your presence, that we might know you. For we know that your word is not just print on a page, it's not just words in a book, it's not just lists of do's and don'ts, rights and wrongs, it's not just histories. Your word is living and active, and by it you make yourself known to us. By it you reveal your heart to us, and you enliven our hearts in the, in the process. And we pray that in this time you would enliven our hearts, that you would awaken our souls, that we might be made complete in your presence. And we do pray for the one who teaches that you'd hide him behind the cross, that in this time we might see Jesus and him only. For it is in his precious name that we pray. Amen. Kelsey slumped down in the passenger seat of the car with her arms folded across her swollen belly. Tears slipped down her cheeks as her boyfriend, boyfriend railed at her. This is all your fault, he said. If you didn't always drag your feet, we'd have made it on time. Fifteen minutes. Fifteen. Minutes and we'd be rid of it. Kelsey winced. It was their baby. At 24 weeks, she'd already felt the flutters of tiny hands and feet. And that morning, as Derek pounded on the bathroom door, she had lain on the cold floor sobbing. And she nearly wept with relief when they checked in late at the abortion clinic and were told that they had already missed their appointment. Derek was unwilling to make the two-hour drive into the city again, and he then announced, when we get back, I want you out. If you think I'm taking care of you and a kid, you're dumber than I thought. Back in the apartment, Kelsey crammed a few items that she owned into an oversized grocery bag, and she headed out into the cold of the fall air. By dusk, Kelsey had searched everywhere to find a place to stay. The town's only shelter was already full. She had no money for a motel. The foster family who had taken her in before she aged out of the system had already moved out of state. She was utterly alone. Kelsey wandered into a residential area and looked at the glowing windows that dotted the street filled with family scenes. And she looked desperately around her. A small backyard shed caught her sight. There was no one home, so she moved toward the gate and found it open. She slipped through. She opened the shed door and closed it quietly behind her. And then she curled up in a ball in one corner of the shed. Kelsey's eyes blurred with tears as she huddled on the cement slab. Her stomach rumbled as she realized that she hadn't eaten anything since that morning. It wasn't supposed to be this way. She couldn't even provide herself with a meal and a roof over her head. How was she supposed to be a mother? Kelsey's story touches our hearts, doesn't it? But, but why? Why do we care? We, we don't know, Kelsey. It, it's not our problem. And yet our very humanity cries out that this is not right. We can't accept that it would happen. That, and how could a boyfriend throw out a, a pregnant girl out on the streets with nothing to go to? It's inhumane. It's inconsistent with our sense of humanity. But where does that sense come from? No one has to teach it to us. Somehow there's something deep inside us that knows that there is a dignity to human life, that there's a value. The ability to even sense that is not just a natural instinct. Animals operate on instinct. 
They avoid death, but they have no judgment over how animals treat other animals. They hold no opinions. They have no beliefs about animal rights, but we assign them rights, animal rights. Why do we do that? We do that because of our humanity. But we are different from the animals. We are not just an animal that is slightly more evolved. We are human. We are created in the image of God. The imago Dei that makes us different. Genesis tells us that God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. This morning, I'd like to suggest that the answers to our questions about our humanity can be found right here in the image of God in which we were created. What makes us human? All that we were created to be, what defines us as human beings, is the image of God in which we were fashioned. The image of God within us separates us from the animals, from all other creatures, making us unique, assigning us a value. Unlike the animals, human beings are able to reason. We're able to choose relationships. We are able to discern right from wrong. We are able to worship God. We are self-aware, moral beings, even if we choose to ignore our moral obligations or purpose. According to strong systematic theology, the image of God consists of both a natural likeness to God and a moral likeness to God or holiness. By natural likeness, he asserts that man was created as a personal being with the twofold power to know self as related to the world and to God and to determine self in view of moral ends. In other words, able to choose right from wrong. This natural likeness is inalienable, meaning that it is unable to be taken away from us or to be cast off by us. And it constitutes a capacity for redemption, giving value to the life even of the unregenerate. Man is said to have possessed the divine image by the fact of creation and not by subsequent bestowal. In other words, the divine image or the imago Dei is part of our being. It is not added. It is not a learned characteristic. The image of God was implanted in us at creation, but it continues despite the fall, despite that major historical shift when we chose to disobey God and sin entered into the world. The intrinsic value instilled by the image of God remains in us despite our sinful condition. And so it was that after the fall, Murder was prohibited on the basis of the sanctity of human life because of our creation in God's image. Genesis 9, 6 says, whoever sheds human blood, by humans their blood shall be shed. For in the image of God has God made mankind. When animals hunt and kill other animals, there's no question of morality involved. Now, if Darwin's origin of the species were correct... There would be no moral consequences for the murder of other humans either, for it would just be part of the natural order. But we were not created and then released to struggle for survival. We were created to flourish and to subdue the earth as bearers of the image of God. When our nation's founders proclaimed that we were endowed by our creator with certain inalienable rights, those are rights that, that, cannot be taken from us, and we cannot cast off. We were endowed by our creator with certain inalienable rights. They made this claim on the basis of the image of God, which we all bear. Animals don't have intrinsic rights. We assign them rights. We may consider the treatment of animals to be inhumane, but that's a reflection of our humanity, not of innate animal rights. Animals are also incapable of making moral choices. While our understanding of precisely what the image of God conveys through us, because there's only seven references to this in the whole Old Testament in just three verses, there still is much that's implied on the basis of being created in the image of God. And we should also note that the ultimate example, the only perfect example of the image of God in a human being would be found in the person of Jesus Christ. He is the only person who has lived 
a perfect and sinless life. The Bible teaches us in Colossians 1 that the Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And in 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, we read that the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ who is the image of God. The glory of Christ who is the image of God. So it is Jesus Christ is the ultimate picture of the image of God in human form. And so he could say, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. We would have to assume that the image of God in us reaches its ultimate expression then as we become more like Jesus. And we're told that that's exactly what God's plan is for us in 2 Corinthians 3.18. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. And again in Romans 8.29, for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. We are created in the image of God. It is common to all human beings. At the same time, the image of God within us is nurtured and perfected as we grow as followers of Jesus Christ. So the image is some, both something that we are and something that we are becoming. To quote Young's systematic theology once again, the moral likeness to God that's contained in his image within us means that mankind was created with such a direction of the affections and of the will as to make God the supreme end of man's being and constituting a finite reflection of God's moral attributes, holy, holiness being the chief of these attributes. In other words, we were created for a relationship with God, and we find our ultimate fulfillment in that relationship. God is holy. He is set apart above his creation. As the creation of a holy God and bearing the image of a holy God, there is an inherent sanctity to human life. Human life is holy. It has value. It is precious. It is to be treated with reverence and respect because it not only reflects but somehow embodies the image of its holy creator. Recognizing this as people who worship God, we recognize our responsibility to speak up for the sanctity of human life. All human life bears God's image and is therefore holy. While a quality of life for those perhaps of great age or infirmity or disabilities may be lessened. Just because the quality of life is lessened does not mean that life itself is any less precious. A perfect example of this would be Johnny Erickson Tata who has lived as a quadriplegic for decades since uh, an accident that, that uh, happened when she was 17 years old. And she has blessed the world with her writings and her paintings and her ministry to people all over the world who are hurting. As people created in the image of God, we must stand out against both euthanasia and suicide both of which are being actively pursued as legislation to make them legal here in the state of Delaware and in many other states and in some places have already been made legal. As people created in the image of God, we also recognize that the unborn already bear that image and are precious in God's sight and in ours. The scriptures tell us that the life of a creature is in their blood. Leviticus 17, 11, the life of a creature is is in the blood. Science confirms that a fetus has blood within a couple days of conception. Therefore, it is a living human being whose life should be protected. In the climate of a culture that sees the termination of that life as being the right of the mother, we should strive to provide young mothers 
with viable options that will allow them to carry their babies to term and then either give them up for adoption or enable them to raise them. As such, our Pregnancy Help Center here in, in Dover called A New Day provides women with counseling and ultrasounds, but it also offers diapers and children's clothing and baby equipment. And we, as a church, partner with them through our giving and our volunteering. And so I'm hoping that you'll be hearing more about other ways that you can be involved with that outreach from our outreach ministry. Well, Kelsey settled down in a shed somewhere in town. Lexi wiped down the kitchen counters and placed Thanksgiving leftovers in the fridge. It had been a busy day full of conversation and feasting and laughter with friends and loved ones, but everyone had gone home and the house was now quiet. In the family room, her husband David and their three children were watching a TV Thanksgiving special and Lexi settled in on the couch, but her thoughts kept straying to a conversation that she'd had with her friend Sheila over pumpkin pie. Sheila had said to her, She's sleeping in a shed somewhere, Lexi, although we don't know where. She was coming to the soup kitchen every day for a while, but vanished. I can't imagine how she'll manage with a newborn. Mark and I would take her baby in a heartbeat, but I don't see how we can make it work right now. Lexi nodded with understanding. Sheila had given birth to a son three weeks earlier, and she and her husband were busy raising two other children as well. Sheila volunteered at the local soup kitchen. She'd gotten to know Kelsey, who would shyly approach the volunteers for a meal. But Sheila hadn't seen her in weeks. Her baby could be born any day now, and no one knew where she was. For the next few weeks, Lexi couldn't get Kelsey and her helpless baby out of her mind. She went to bed praying for them. She dreamed about them. And she woke up wondering if Kelsey had made it through another night. She couldn't, sense, she couldn't shake the sense that, that she had an important role to play in the life of this precious baby and her hurting mother. She prayed that her husband would feel that same prompting. That is, if only they could find Kelsey. Later that day, the phone rang. Lexi, it's Sheila. We found her. She's in a hospital 30 minutes from here. She's going into labor. Would you come with me? I don't want her to be alone. Lexi promised to meet Sheila at her house, and they'd drive to the hospital together. But first, she rushed to David's study to ask him a question. His answer might just change their lives. The image of God within us makes every human life sacred. The image of God within us demands that we respect every human life, that we are kind and compassionate to one another. The image of God within us also reflects the character of God, for God is a God of order. Before we're told of the creation of human beings in the image of God, we're told the story of the creation of the world and the universe itself, where God brought order out of chaos. We read in Genesis 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. God took the chaos of the unformed earth and created order. He took that which was formless and gave it form. And when he created human beings, he sent them into the world to continue to bring order to the world, to fill it and subdue it. Genesis 1.28, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. God sends us into creation to continue to bring order order. We're told in 1 Corinthians 14, everything should be done in a fitting and orderly way. You know, it grieves me that the people of our nation have taken to responding to issues with violence and disorder. 
that violates the image of God that is within us. Whether it's Black Lives Matter protests that promote lawless cities with police-free zones, or Trump supporters who would storm our nation's capital. These movements do violence to the image of God within us. And they ignore the orderly channels of justice and change that are available to us. In reality, we've become like spoiled children who throw temper tantrums when we don't get our way in anything. The image of God within us longs for order. We long for those happily ever after endings. We long for peace and order in our lives because we are created in the image of our creator. It was 10 years later when Kelsey stooped down to check the buttons on her three-year-old son's coat. She laughed when he stuck out his tongue in order to catch a snowflake from the snow that was swirling around them. Bundled up revelers roamed the downtown Christmas festival, listening to carols on the loudspeaker system and commenting on the various light displays. Just a few years ago, Kelsey could never have dreamed she would end up back in the same town with a family of her own. But she had felt an inexplicable tug to come visit over the Christmas holiday and her husband had graciously agreed. He knew her story and knew that what it might mean to her to return to the place where she had made such a, a momentous decision a decade earlier. After giving birth, Sheila and Lexi had extended many offers of help, but Kelsey had left the state and went to live with the foster family who had been so welcoming to her when she was a teen. She found a job, she began attending a church. She found the man who would eventually be her husband, but most importantly, she had found Christ. The love, the grace, the forgiveness she discovered in him had profoundly changed her life. Ever since, she had prayed each day that the baby girl that she had placed up for adoption was being raised by parents who would nurture that same faith in her. Kelsey's husband had wandered off to find some hot chocolate for little Theo. And so she guided their son toward the live nativity scene that was set up outside the little Main Street Chapel. As they neared the life-sized creche, Theo exclaimed, Baby Jesus! And Kelsey smiled and she looked at the little family of three in the manger. And then she froze. Mary was being played by a girl who must have been around 10 years old. She gazed at the baby doll in her arms and smiled at passers-by, crooning a slightly off-key rendition of Silent Night with the rest of the actors. And she was the spitting image of Kelsey. It was unmistakable, the dark curly hair, the brown eyes, the shape of her nose, the smile. Kelsey could have been looking at herself 20 years before. As she watched, the young girl stood up and a middle-aged woman handed the girl a steaming mug and rubbed her hands up and down the girl's arms to warm her. And they laughed together and the girl ran to a group of friends. The woman stood up still smiling and then she looked outside and Kelsey met her eyes and it all came back in a rush. That frigid December morning when she had stumbled into the hospital, the labor pains, the paralyzing fear about what she would do when the baby was born. Sheila holding her hand and encouraging her through the delivery and the kind woman who was such a steady, calming presence throughout the difficult labor. Following the birth of a healthy girl, Kelsey had stared down at the tiny sleeping face and wept. She was overwhelmed with love for her baby, but she knew she was in no position to raise her. She knew what she had to do, but she also knew that it would break her heart in two. With her daughter swaddled in her arms and tears streaming down her face, Kelsey reached for her. Kelsey confided in Sheila and Lexi that she'd decided on adoption and asked if they'd help her start the process. Without hesitating, the compassionate, soft spoken woman named Lexi had reached for Kelsey's hand. If you're willing, she said. My husband and I will take your baby. We'll adopt her. Kelsey would never forget her. 
And now as she stood on the sidewalk, Lexi descended the chapel steps and approached her. She engulfed Kelsey in a warm hug and bent down to introduce herself to little Theo. I am so glad to see you, Kelsey. You look wonderful. Are you doing well? Kelsey nodded and she briefly filled her in on, on the last decade of her life. And at that moment, the young Mary ex exited the chapel and skipped down the steps toward the two women. She stepped close to Lexi and smiled timidly at Kelsey and Theo. Lexi wrapped her arm around her daughter and said to Kelsey, I'd like to introduce you to Hannah. She smiled. We named her after a courageous woman in the Bible who did the toughest thing that any mother could ever do. She relinquished her child to the care of another. Kelsey fought back the lump in her throat as she gent gently shook hands with this young girl who was brimming with such life and hope. Kelsey collected herself and nodded. I love Hannah's story in the Bible. Lexi reached out and squeezed her arm. Her middle name is Kelsey. While there are many aspects of the image of God which we bear that affect the way that we live, that we act, the way that we believe, one prominent aspect of the Imago Dei is found in relationships. The triune God exists eternally in relationship as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God is one God, but he exists in three persons in complete and perfect relationship with one another. And he has also created us with the capacity for and the proclivity toward relationships, relationships both with God and with others. Genesis 1:27. God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. He created them. God created us male and female that we might know a relationship that reflects the unity of the Godhead through marriage. We are created with a need for relationship with others. As God said when he created woman, the Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. alone. I will make a suitable helper for him. We were not created to be loners. We were created to be in relationship. And the image of God within us yearns for that relationship with one another, but also for a right relationship with the one who made us. The image of God within us is never complete until it's found in a loving relationship with the God whose image we bear. Did you hear that? The image of God within us is never complete until it's found in a loving relationship with the God whose image we bear. Blaise Pascal is often quoted as saying that there is a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of each man which cannot be satisfied by any created thing but only by God the creator made known through Christ Jesus. A fuller commentary on this effect of the image of God created within us, it can be found in Pascal's work, Pensies, where we read, what else does this craving and this helplessness proclaim but that there was once in man a true happiness of which all that now remains is the empty print and trace. This he tries in vain to fill with everything around him, seeking in things that are not there the help he cannot find in those that are, though none can help. Since this infinite abyss can be filled only with an infinite and immutable object, in other words, by God himself. What a picture. An infinite abyss, a bottomless pit in our souls that can only be filled by something that is infinite and unchanging. It can only be filled by the presence of the infinite and unchanging God in whose image it was created. When Jesus was challenged about whether it was right to pay taxes to Caesar or not. He asked someone to produce a coin. And the coin that they produced was a denarius that had the image and the inscription of Caesar. And then Jesus replies, so give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. In other words, that which bears the image of Caesar is Caesar's. It belongs to Caesar. And in the same manner, that which bears the image of God belongs to God. St. Augustine of Hippo reflected the same idea when he prayed this prayer. 
Thou hast made us for thyself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it finds rest in thee. We have been created in the image of God, and that image only finds fulfillment in a right relationship with its creator. But the wondrous thing is this. Not only, not only is it humanity that yearns to know and love God, but the God who loves us, all, who knows us, also loves us as well. While the image of God within us propels us to search for God, we soon find in our search that God has been pursuing us all along. And in his pursuit for us, God held nothing back. Jesus Christ came into the world to bring us to God. He gave himself up completely in his efforts to redeem us. He laid down his own life for the sake of our lives. The Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Sound familiar? And we're told that all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. It is when we receive Jesus, when we enter into, into a relationship with God, believing that he sent Jesus to die for us and that Jesus rose from the dead and that he lives. When we decide to follow him and invite him into our hearts, then the spirit of God, that infinite spirit of God comes into our lives and begins the process of completing the image of God for which we were created. You were created. In the image of God. You were not a mistake. You were not an accident. You are in fact the precious child. Of a loving heavenly father. His spitting image. And while the world may try to rob you. Of the dignity that is your birthright. No one can take it away. It remains yours to claim. Are you secure in that birthright today? Do you know what it is to live in accordance with the image of God that's within you? Have you found the source of your soul's yearning? God invites you today to come to him in faith. As Psalm 34, 8 proclaims, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Let's pray. Lord, that yearning of our souls that longing for something more we have defined in so many ways we have looked for in all the wrong places. And we are told that it will never be filled until it's filled by your presence. And so we pray, Lord, that you would come to us and fill us with your presence. We pray, Lord, for the one who's never known that presence, that they might trust in you at this moment, that, that they might find in you the fulfillment of what they were created for, their completion in their humanity. We pray, Father, for those of us who have given our lives to you, are ready, are ready to follow you. Lord, fill us all the more that, that the image of your presence might spill out in all the places where we go and that people may know your image, they may know you because they see you reflected in our lives. We pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen.